present you now Mr. Jonathan Edelheit, co-founder and CEO, CEO, Medical Tourism Association from United States of America. Uh, Mr. Jonathan, can you come here? I will now read a really, really great CV. Uh, Jonathan Edelheit is uh, president of the Medical Tourism Association, the international non-profit trade association for the medical tourism industry. Mr. Edelheit and MTA currently consult and represent several governments in their medical tourism plans and initiatives and is currently working with some of the largest U.S. health insurance companies and employers in implementing medical tourism into their health plans. Uh, the MTA is made up of the top hospitals and insurance companies from around the world. Mr. Edelheit is also co-editor of the Medical Tourism Magazine, a monthly magazine published by the Medical Tourism Association. You see, really, really a rich CV. And Mr. Edelheit is now give some words and he will open the general session, New Emerging Markets. Uh, his speech will be about the importance of targeted marketing. marketing. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and it's uh, great to be here in Vienna this morning. Even though it's uh, raining out, it is really a beautiful city. But sometimes when you have a conference, I think it is better when it rains a little or if it's cold, and it keeps people kind of contained and networking. Um, I'm excited to be here today, and you know, one thing I would uh, like to do first is thank uh, Deslov, who I think has been a little bit of a visionary in European health tourism. Um, you know, he's been organizing an event in health tourism for Europe for years. Um, at last year's event in Croatia, it was amazing to see how many uh, countries came together for that event from Jordan to Sweden, you know, from the U.S. to Asia, really all over the world to come and learn and see what's happening in Europe. And what I think is very interesting is Europe has some of the best infrastructure for both medical and wellness tourism. Um, it has a rich history of, of being really one of the first destinations in the world for people traveling for health and wellness. Um, but at the same time, I think what we've seen is Europe you know, has had very specific markets that it has uh, received patients from, but Europe as a whole or even potentially countries within Europe have not really been uh, active in going out in the global market um, to really, I would say, claim or take its market share of medical and wellness tourism. Um, and I think we've seen over the years uh, a lot of destinations um, that have emerged that started from scratch in medical tourism or in a very short period of time built up their whole healthcare infrastructure and then went out and took a large portion of the market share in, uh, in medical tourism. And I think that you know, what is really amazing to see is we, we really see this momentum and this coming together of Europe. And I think in the next few years, you're going to see a lot more growth from the European marketplace going forward. Um, as more destinations come together put aside their competition, work together to establish a brand for their country or for their region. And I think that uh, you know, events like this are very important where everyone can come together and they can learn about best practices, what's working, but I think even more importantly, what's not working. Um, I, I think the medical and wellness tourism industry has matured over the years quite significantly. Um, and I think that you know, there is a clear understanding for the players in the industry of how they need to create a long-term roadmap that's sustainable and really push forward the right initiatives. And it's, this is not an industry where you're going to go and you know, try to make uh, quick money or you're going to come into it and immediately have a return or where you can just say, I'm going to invest just this year but not next year. It's all about having that long three to five uh, year roadmap. So I'm going to go into a little bit um, on uh, the marketing side um, and how to get your market share. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, it's an industry where you have to think things out. So I think the first question everybody always has to ask is, who is my customer? 
meaning, you know, who is my target patient for whether it's wellness or medical tourism. Um, you know, you can't go out and say, I'm going to go after um, everyone in the world. Um, the potential medical tourists are going to be, I want to go after North America, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, um, Europe. You need to have a very specific focus where you can create a targeted focus, build relationships in that sector and, and grow. Um, you can't just, it's like going into a restaurant. Um, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll talk to hospitals or countries and they're saying they're going after a large market. It's like going into a restaurant where they have a menu and on that menu they have Italian, French, American, Chinese. I'm sure some of you have been that, in that restaurant where it's, the menu is huge and you actually don't even know what you're going to order. Um, another big challenge in the industry is I call it, we'll call it the medical tourism superhero effect. And that is where it's, I don't need help. I'm perfect. We understand everything about what we need to do in our infrastructure in medical tourism. We understand our target market. We understand how to market. We understand everything. We don't need any help. You know, in any industry, in any sector, there's always room for improvement. There's always room to do things better. You know, we, we as an association, we work in over 100 countries around the world, working with the ministries of health, of tourism, of economic development, with the hospitals, insurance companies, buyers, and we're always learning something new. You're always learning about new challenges, new obstacles, new things that work, um, new target markets. And so I think everyone has to in this industry you know, uh, you know, put aside ego, put aside pride and say, there is a lot I can learn. And I think that even in this room, one of the opportunities that I encourage is to really introduce yourself and network with as many people as you can because you never know what you're going to learn and what is that cutting edge thing that another country or a competitor is doing that works. And I think that people are also in this industry very open to sharing to say, this doesn't work. Don't do this initiative. Don't, don't mark it in this way. Um, and if we can focus on that, I think the industry will move forward uh, significantly faster. Another big challenge in medical tourism is also this uh, you know, theory that patients will come. So I, I use this image almost like um, you know, you, you've put in the bottle uh, an offering of medical tourism to patients or wellness tourism and he's throwing the bottle in the water. So this is, he's running the international patient department or the marketing for the wellness or medical tourism and he's hoping that some patient somewhere in the world is going to pick up this bottle, read the message of their medical tourism offering and saying, yes, I would like to actually go to your destination for healthcare. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You have to figure out, you know, if you're here and you're saying, I'm, uh, you know, from Vienna or Croatia, I want to go after the German, uh, German tourists to come to my destination, or I want to go after, you know, someone from the Emirates or Saudi. You have to have a very specific initiative, but you also have to have the infrastructure in place. Um, and when I say the infrastructure, I mean the training, the certification, the processes in place of how you're going to even treat medical or wellness tourists coming to your destination. And that's a totally different topic than marketing. Um, it's important to, you know, you can't necessarily take a marketing person and tell them that now you're running an international patient department for hospitals and you're going to serve patients. That marketing person might not have any experience in how to service international patients. And it goes the opposite way too. You can't necessarily tell an international patient services director that now you're in charge of marketing, go figure out how to bring patients into our hospital because that person might not have that experience or background or training in marketing. And medical and wellness tourism, there's a tremendous amount of word of mouth referral that comes from this industry. And it's all about the experience of that tourist and that healthcare consumer. If they have an amazing experience, then they're going to recommend to other people and they're going to travel again. Um, to give you an example of a destination that I think really understands it, um, you know, I'll give you two examples. You know, one is you know, the island of Puerto Rico. Um, you know, we're finishing up a three-year project with the island of Puerto Rico where they understood that you know, medical and wellness tourism would have a significant impact on the economy and that also um, above and beyond that it would increase the quality of healthcare and they wanted to make sure 
that every healthcare consumer that came to their island had an amazing experience. So we worked with them to certify and train 47 of their hospitals and clinics. We went in and, and trained their hotels, and their hotels got our Well Hotel certification program for treating wellness and medical tourists. The training and certifying the airports, the taxi drivers, cruise personnel, government officials, because they wanted a 360 degree approach, knowing that when a healthcare consumer got off the plane or got off a cruise ship, from the moment they stepped onto the island to the moment that they stepped off, that everybody knew the expectations and the needs of that patient, and so they could exceed those expectations. And then what the government of Puerto Rico has done is, you know, they've come together and put aside all the competition, the government departments, the hospitals, the clinics, the hotels, and they're creating a PPP, a public-private partnership, that is going to focus on bringing in inbound patients to the country. And now the government is going to be investing millions of dollars over the next few years in marketing and establishing a brand for Puerto Rico as a destination. And they're being very selective in their target markets. So they're picking like five target markets and they're going after them with a very specific multi-year campaign um, to, Puerto uh, to Puerto Rico. So, and that includes them going out in trade missions to their target market, bringing familiarization trips to Puerto Rico. Um, but it's a long-term roadmap. It's a three to five year roadmap where they actually expect it to bring in $300 million to the economy of Puerto Rico and to create 3,000 jobs and bring in 30,000 healthcare consumers. Um, another important factor is I think what we've seen is competition is increasing in medical tourism. You know, if, if, if I step back to around 2004 when I was first getting involved in medical tourism, when I was in the insurance industry in the U.S., um, you know, there weren't that many destinations doing medical tourism actively. There were five to seven, maybe, um, India, Thailand, Singapore. And, but now, I mean, you have 50, 60 countries actively marketing medical tourism. And you have this actually as a top economic priority for most countries around the world, where, for example, in Korea, you know, this industry is just behind, you know, the car industry, the auto industry. Um, and in many countries are very aggressive. Korea brought us in in 2008 to, you know, help them look at building out their healthcare infrastructure and their medical tourism programs. And we came in, um, you know, and we gave them the guidance on how they needed to move towards international accreditation, uh, training of doctors and nurses, how they had to establish a global brand. But they understood they had to have the infrastructure in place first. And then once they did that, then they could go out and brand and, and develop relationships. And the government really got behind supporting the hospitals. And when I look at where they are from then to today, it's amazing. You know, they're one of the top destinations in the world. In two to three years, they went from zero to 60, where they weren't on the map at all for healthcare, to where they were known as one of the top destinations in the world. Um, and I remember at our 2010 conference in Los Angeles, sitting the Under Secretary of Health for South Korea at a table with me with the Under Secretary of Health of the United Arab Emirates in discussing an opportunity for collaboration where Korean doctors would go to the Emirates to do training, Emirati doctors would go to, um, to uh, South Korea for training, and there was even a discussion of potential facilities uh, that are Korean being built in the Emirates. And it happened. You know, within a very short period, it, it all came together. Um, South Korean hospitals are now looking at building hospitals in Los Angeles and really expanding. And we just finished a big project for Korea in looking at penetrating the MENA market. Um, but Korea, you know, the government, all aspects of it is supporting it and laying out the roadmap for the private uh, sector. So as the competition is growing, you have to ask yourself, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to be the one, you know, paralyzed? Um, you know, or are you going to look at what do I need to do? What do I need to do differently to differentiate myself in medical tourism? If you stand still and you don't do anything, you're not going to gain market share. And, you know, there are buyers coming into this industry every day now. Um, new buyers. And if you're not out developing relationships with those buyers, you're not going to get the healthcare consumers. They're not going to come to you. A, a simple one page brochure, a website, doing press releases isn't going to cut it. Everyone is doing that. And you have to build healthcare trust 
to get consumers to want to come to your destination. And that's an area that I think is one of the biggest gaps that everyone has to work on. You know, you have to put yourselves in the shoes of the healthcare consumer and say, if I'm going to travel abroad for healthcare, what would I need to know to be comfortable in this destination, going to this hospital, going to this wellness resort, that would make me actually get on a plane and travel around the world for this? And that's not easy. And that little simple brochure or website or press release isn't going to cut it. Um, and, and a perfect example of, uh, of this too is India used to be really the top, one of the top destinations for medical tourism. Um, and I, you know, they have high quality and the most affordable pricing. But the one thing that ended up happening is they were getting a lot of patients, so they stopped actively going out into the marketplace and developing relationships with buyers. And so what happened is their reputation declined, the brand awareness declined, and a lot of other countries started to get the patients that um, India was getting. Um, and that's a perfect example that you, know, you need to get to your market position, but you have to maintain it and keep it. Um, so I think regional medical tourism is changing. You know, we're seeing more multinational uh, employers starting to offer medical tourism, uh, private business groups, uh, insurance companies. We're seeing this, a much greater acceptance. Um, we're, you know, with international insurance companies or employers, we're seeing where in the past, they really didn't have anything organized for medical tourism, and now they're starting to implement it, and it's becoming accepted. When I was talking about new buyers entering the market every day, you have air ambulance companies, um, health authorities, uh, employers referring uh, hospitals, uh, facilitators, travel insurers. But there are thousands of these companies everywhere in the world, and you never know who is going to be that new referral source. And there are so many ways that you can touch them from you know, traveling to a conference in a different country or going to a trade mission, um, going on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is one of, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate. It's one of the most powerful tools to find buyers that otherwise you wouldn't know exist and go to connect with them. Um, you know, we focused heavily on LinkedIn back uh, in 2007 and 2008 in creating specific channels and groups in LinkedIn to really capture the attention of buyers. And now we have actually 30 groups in LinkedIn with over 800,000 members, and we're on track to hit about 1.2 million by the end of this year. Um, and if you're not active on LinkedIn, it's a great way to network with people. And once you connect, you're like a business colleague, a friend. Um, and uh, I think participating in trade missions is a great way. Um, you know, we're opening up the China marketplace right now. Uh, working at a high level with the China government and doing trade missions. And uh, about 60,000 Chinese patients traveled abroad last year for medical tourism. And it's probably going to be in the hundreds of thousands in the next year or two and in the millions in the next few years because the market is just learning about healthcare. So we've, um, besides bringing European and US uh, providers into China, um, we are also, you know, bringing the big China delegations. We had a big delegation that went into London last September and then into the U.S. And what's interesting about China is, you know, for the people who have money, they want to go abroad. They want to get care, but they don't necessarily have access to the Internet. They don't know who the best hospitals are or who the best brands are. They're trying to figure out medical tourism, but they're sending out large volumes of patients. I mean, there's well-funded companies out over there. that We have one member, St. Lucia Consulting, that got a $10 million investment. They put stores in the luxury malls, and they charge patients $10,000 just to use their service to travel into the U.S. for health care. And for some of their ultra-rich patients, um, they had one that was coming in for a transplant to Partners Hospital, Harvard Hospital in Boston, where it was a million dollar procedure. And United Healthcare, uh, the big insurance company, uh, was trying to offer them their network and said, we can reduce this, this transplant cost to 200000 so an $800,000 savings. And the Chinese patient said, no thank you. I will pay the million dollars to partners because I want the absolute best care possible and I don't want to have some kind of a discount that might affect how the hospital treats me. Um, so in China you have very rich patients and then you have the middle class and it's fascinating to see when we were there for our trade mission in November, um, the, you know, there was uh, one uh, young kid there who was 22 years old in jeans and a dress shirt 
and he had created a website for uh, Chinese people going abroad, and he had sent, in the last 12 months, a thousand Chinese patients abroad, um, just from a website. So we're gonna see hundreds of those companies emerge sending Chinese abroad, and the Chinese really, they don't know what are the best destinations, what are the best hospitals, and the only way to enter that market is to go and be in front of them and build relationships. But when I say that, it's not like you can just go into China and it's really easy and you're gonna get rich and you're gonna make a lot of great relationships. It's one of the most difficult markets to enter. Um, it's very difficult to find the right partners. There will be a lot of people that you meet that will say, I'm your access to China. Um, I, I have great relationships with the government and the hospitals. Um, pay me $5,000 a month and I will get you a lot of patients. And then, you know, you get nothing in return. Um, there's a lot of hospitals that have gone in there and pulled out. Um, you know, it's a very, very specific market that you really have to choose your partners well. And if you don't, they can ruin your brand and reputation there. Um, and there's obviously a language barrier. But, you know, just like China, every target market for healthcare consumers is very unique and you have to approach it very carefully. Um, in May, we'll be releasing our new Global Medical Tourism Index, kind of our um, you know, rankings for the, uh, for the industry. Um, it'll be released May 1st, and it's based off of three dimensions and 34 criteria. It was released several years ago, um, uh, and had been accepted by one of the top academic tourism journals in the world. Um, it's, there's 41 countries that will be listed when it's released, and there's uh, just under 5,000 respondents that we surveyed. And this was actually American consumer perception of what are those top destinations for medical tourism. And uh, you know the, 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 the survey in the Medical Tourism Index is this can actually be done for any consumer market. Um, so, for example, if you're here in Europe and you're saying, I want the German or the United Kingdom uh, market, there can be a specific medical tourism index that's done for that market and viewing how your country is perceived by consumers from Germany or the United K Kingdom and how you're perceived amongst other, uh, other uh, regional destinations. And I won't go into all this, but it just shows the profile of the respondents. It's almost an even split between females and males. And, their educational level, their ethnicity, the age and marital status, and from what regions they were actually surveyed from. It's, it's a very long uh, survey, um, but it actually measures the attractiveness of a destination focused on cur uh, country image um, and environment, healthcare and tourism attractiveness, the infrastructure and the quality of the medical uh, facilities. And these are some of the dimensions that it's actually measured on. And so if we look at um, you know, the European ranking, this is where we see the ranking from um, uh, one to, uh, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, to eight in, in Europe. Um, so actually the United Kingdom was ranked the highest, uh, followed by Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Poland, Malta, and Turkey. Um, and when uh, the current, uh, the last index was done in 2014, and there's a website, medicaltourismindex.com, where you can go on and actually play with it to determine how was that ranking, um, what was the score for the different dimensions within for each country. Um, but I think this is a, a really great um, baseline where you can then look at why, how am I viewed and why am I viewed. And now for the first time, you can determine what do I need to focus on over the next couple of years in very specific areas to address how I'm perceived by my target market so I can increase my, my, my viewing and my ranking and get more healthcare consumers to travel to my country. Because without this, you really don't know and you might be marketing the wrong way and the wrong initiatives. So if you, if you come into some subset with this, into some certain dimensions is United Kingdom was actually ranked uh, number one under country environment. Um, so there's a lot of different rankings within each of the dimensions. Um, interestingly enough, Italy was ranked number one under the dimension of medical tourism. 
um, and that, that, you know, the country environment is safety and tourism, where, you, you know, UK was rated where the dimension of medical tourism is more in the offering of the medical tourism, the packages and the services and the affordability. And then Germany was ranked number one in facility and services, um, which should mean hospital infrastructure and, and quality. Um, so now, if you're United Kingdom, you understand where you rank number one, and now, you know, what do I need to do to keep that country environment ranking at number one, but focus on the medical tourism aspects and the facility and services. Um, so I think, you know, some of the challenges in the industry is how does everything work in medical tourism? So, you know, typically this is how it all works now. Um, how, how the processes and systems of how healthcare consumers are, are initially communicated with to how they're dealt with when they're actually at the hospital or the facility. Um, a lot of it is, is patchwork together, um, done with best efforts and best intentions, but there's not a lot of processes and standards in place. Um, and, uh, and, and along with this too, I think one of the challenges in the industry moving forward is you know how are patients communicated with? How are they reached by a destination or a hospital? Um, there's really no system in place. You know, uh, we're using to manage patient inquiries, Microsoft Excel, Outlook, Word, paper and pen. There's no other industry that doesn't have systems and standards in place in how you deal with patients. And I think a dirty um, secret in the industry is no one's really protecting patient privacy or medical records. Um, everyone says they are, but they're not. They're sending emails via Outlook in, in Dropbox and things like that. And that's a real issue for growth because as more institutional buyers get into this industry, and in, you know, it's, whether it's in Europe, where they've got some of the strictest privacy laws in the world, or the U.S., is these in institutional buyers are not going to implement medical tourism unless they know that people's medical information is secure and there's a system in place. And even you know, and then if if someone misrepresents that they're doing that, once the institutional buyer finds out, they're no longer going to work with that hospital, that destination, that buyer, but it also undermines, I think, the credibility of the entire industry. And then also, how do you actually streamline the process for patients? How do you make sure that nothing is, is lost in, in, um, in the process of when a patient is coming to the hospital? You need a system in place. You can't track that with paper and pen. Um, and, you know, we've worked with um, Health Flight Solutions out of Orlando, Florida, um, in, in developing the global patient management system, which is a system that kind of coordinates everything and brings together the healthcare consumer with the hospital, with the facilitator, with the insurance company or government or employer into one system. So actually Puerto Rico, um, you know, who understand the whole 360 of training, certification, infrastructure, marketing, um, you know, they just uh, last week signed up to launch this portal for their destination that they're going to bring all their hospitals and hotels on board. But literally, this is how the industry is running now of how patients come to hospitals or, you know, or even working with facilitators is everything, you know, there's a ton of arrows in different directions. It's very disorganized. And how do you convert more patients? Um, if you don't have systems in place, how do you, if you don't have systems, you can't improve those systems. Um, if you're a destination or hospital and you ask um, uh, your internal departments, how many patients am I getting from Russia last year? How many patient leads do I have coming in from Germany for orthopedic procedures next month? A lot of times it's, it's they don't have an answer or it's going to take a lot of time where by a flick of a switch you can actually have that information. But I think um, one reason I'm very passionate about the global patient management system goes back to that what I was talking about is healthcare trust and also um, engagement and utilization. When I implemented medical tourism back in 2004 and 5 into US insurance plans, the biggest gap that I saw was that healthcare trust is, you know, and, and I still see this today, is, is not much has changed. A hospital signs up with an insurance company, an employer, or health authority. They give them a nice brochure, say, I have a beautiful website, send me patients. A year goes by, a lot, not a lot of the patients travel abroad. And then the buyer, after the year, looks and says, 
why didn't this employer or insurance company send me patients? They must not be interested in coming to my destination. They might not be interested in coming to medical tourism. And then the, um, if you look at the other side, you know, the, the, the hospital says, why haven't I gotten patients? Everybody's looking and saying, why haven't I gotten patients and blaming the other party? No one ever looked and said, how did we actually engage the end consumer and educate them and make them aware that the benefits actually exist and why they should travel? And no one did. Um, but when you do, you actually act, get what we call in the insurance industry utilization. There's an employer in the U.S. called HSM Manufacturing, which is a self-funded employer. So, you know, in the U.S., uh, almost 95% of employers with over 5,000 employees are self-funded. It means the employer pays their own health insurance for their employees. Um, and they don't work with insurance companies. So with HSM, they actually rolled out a benefit um, where they waived deductible and co-insurance several thousand dollars for their employees. If they traveled abroad, they paid for airfare and hotel. Um, they, w they also covered the cost for a companion or a loved one. And they gave uh, their employees $2,000 um, in cash if they traveled. So an employee would actually save three to $5,000 if they went abroad, plus get several thousand dollars in their own pocket. It was a very meaningful benefit. But they actually went and did on-site meetings to the employees, educating them on the medical tourism benefit. They actually flew doctors, for example, from Costa Rica into the manufacturing facility to meet with the employees so the employees could see those doctors, touch those doctors, and build a relationship with those doctors. And what ended up happening is they ended up sending 250 employees overseas uh, over the course of five years. They saved $10 million. And this was a company in the deep south in the US, and they had people going to India originally. Then they changed to Costa Rica. And now they're sending them to Puerto Rico and the Cayman Islands. But what they actually did was they changed the entire corporate culture where their employees actually prefer to go abroad rather than get care here uh, you know, in, in the United States. And so when you create that culture, then you're going to get significant utilization. So um, you know, when you're approaching the buyers, you have to figure out, what do I need to put in the hands of the buyers? But what do I need to put in the hands of the members or the healthcare consumers to actually get them to have confidence to want to travel? And, and it's not just you know, a plan member, meaning an employee of an employer, but how do I give tools to their spouse, to their family members, if they're researching the medical tourism options so they travel for care? Um, am I putting videos? of our hospital online? Am I putting videos of our doctors so people can experience um, what that doctor is like and build a connection with them? Am I putting patient videos online so I can, as a consumer, if I'm in Germany, I can go listen to another German consumer talk about going to that hospital or destination and say that could be me and I'll feel confident. But when you do these things, there's, there's the right way to do things and there's the, the wrong way. You know, if you're putting up videos, are your videos professionally done? Um, you know, we've seen some hospitals in Asia where they've put videos up, but they're done by, you know, they don't bring in a local videographer or professional to film the videos. You know, they give a, a video camera to the international patient department and, and expect them to be a videographer and say, go and make us videos of patient testimonials. If those videos come out unprofessional, um, and they're not, a, not the right quality in the video or the patient isn't saying the right thing, it actually has the opposite effect for you, where you know, patients look at it and say, well, if they can't produce quality videos um, of their patient, what is the actual quality of healthcare and experience like? Um, you know, are you allowing you know, telemedicine where your doctor can actually video in with the potential patient? Are you allowing the doctor at home to, to do telemedicine and video in with the patient abroad? Um, how are you running reporting? When I was talking about um, reporting and, and systems, um, how are you managing, for example, if you have patients, hopefully you can see all this, 
what treatments they're coming to the hospital for, and then how are you tracking, you know, you see here like little green flags and red flags, like things for your international patient department or even a wellness hotel to know what's missing in that patient coming to your facility. Where are they in the process? Did you get the lead? Um, in? Has the doctor responded um, with their uh, second opinion? Have they, have you given a price quote? Have they sent their medical records? Are they, have they come to your hospital? Have they gotten the surgery? How do you know all these things have come and happened? Because that's impossible to manage on a paper, uh, paper and pen. Uh, you know, another big area when, um, if I go back to this uh, shot with second opinions, is this is gonna be a huge driver in medical tourism going forward in the future. It's second opinions are the gateway to medical tourism. Um, it's up to 40% of diagnoses are, are misdiagnosed. And in some categories, it can, or countries, it can go up to 70 or 90%. And that means that there are local doctors who are misdiagnosing patients. So if you are offering second opinions in your target market, you're gonna build up tremendous trust and confidence with those patients, and then they're gonna wanna travel to your country for uh, medical or wellness tourism. And so if you're, here in Croatia and you give a second opinion to a German citizen and you tell them that their local doctor told them that they had this cancer and this was the treatment option, if you're telling them, no, 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 you don't need that treatment option, there's a less invasive or better cancer treatment and we can do it here for you, they're gonna trust you and then they're gonna wanna come to your destination for care and they're gonna tell their friends, this doctor in this country knows better and has more expertise than my local doctor, you should get second opinions from them in the future. And so we're seeing a lot of employers and insurance companies and governments starting to implement these remote second opinions. Um, and I've even had, had it happen personally to my family members. So to me, I'm now super passionate about second opinions because what we all don't realize is we have implicit trust with our doctors. So I had a family member who one of their, you know, like their general practitioner doctors that they see every year, um, you know, they, they, had, they got diagnosed with something and they were told, go to this specialist. This, this is the specialist I refer people to, you know, they do great care in this specialty. So what has happened when your trusted doctor refers you to a specialist, typically as a patient? You typically don't even really look at the other doctor's CV or credentials you go to that doctor with utmost faith um, in knowing that they must be the best because they were referred to you by your primary physician or general practitioner. And then what ended up happening is that that specialist told my family member, um, this is the procedure that you need. You're, you know, it's pretty much gonna be success and let's go get this surgery scheduled. Um, and not too many questions were asked. Um, and I was, I was there with them and uh, and then what we did is I said, listen, I'm gonna schedule a second opinion um, so we can get another doctor's advice. I scheduled a second opinion. It went from 100% success to 2% success for that, for that uh, medical procedure, a 98% difference. And then the second doctor explained why the other doctor was, I would say, terrible um, and why he was selling the procedure to us and how he didn't actually have the experience, the board credentials to make a determination. And then all of a sudden you started realizing how that visit, there was no real evidence, there was no statistics shared with you. It, it was a very, um, just a very positive, not detailed meeting. And then what did I do? I got a third opinion. Um, and then that family member is going to uh, the third doctor um, and even got better advice from that third doctor and more inf information. But that third specialist was one of the best in the world that is doing the research and the development in care. And so second opinions, you can touch anyone anywhere in the world to do a second opinion. Um, and I think it's, it's an amazing, uh, amazing way to really build a medical tourism initiative. So when I was talking about reporting too, is I think, uh, you know, this is a, just a screenshot from that global patient management system, is how do you know how many leads you got in or patients for heart procedures, orthopedics, cancer? Um, you know, a click of a button, how do you look at, um, this is an example of uh, leads coming in and being converted by country. How do you know where to spend your marketing dollars, right? If you're not measuring 
where and, and can at a, a click of a button show where your leads are coming in from for what procedures and where you're converting them, how do you know where to spend your money? How do you know where the gaps are? Um, you might actually find out you're not converting patients from Russia, um, and is it why? And there's no way for you to know. But if, you, if you're if you generating reports from it, you might be able to do that and determine, well, it's my doctor is taking two weeks to respond to the patient. And because of that, and Russian patients instantly want a diagnosis and a quote, I'm, I'm losing patients. Um, you might determine that your market in getting patients from Kenya has significantly increased, and you are going to conferences in Kenya. So now you know, hey, I'm going to go back to the C-suite in the hospital or the marketing department and say, let's invest more in Kenya in going to conferences. Um, so I think it's, uh, it provides very intelligent uh, decision making. So another key aspect that I think is super important in this industry is if you're a hospital or you're a country or destination, protect your buyers. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you have a relationship with a buyer who's sending you patients, you know, hold them close, develop a long-term relationship, you know, make sure that you're touching them um, on the phone, in email, in person, um, and also do not, you know, go around the back of the buyers. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of buyers or facilitators in the industry that we're working very closely with because they're sending, they were sending patients into specific countries or specific hospitals. And then the hospital or that destination was taking those patients from them. Um, meaning, for example, like they might be referring a patient to a hospital in India, and the moment they give the patient the quote, the patient contacts the hospital in India, and the hospital in India decides we're going to work with this patient directly so we don't have to pay the facilitator commission. Um, and it's a very short-term approach. Um, yes, you might be able to convert that patient or the other or, or the next patient, but then that facilitator isn't going to refer you more patients. So in the long run, you're going to lose the, your, your market share. And this is happening every day in the industry, but it's also I think it, it affects the growth of the industry because for the facilitators, how do they know that they can maintain their business on solid footing? How do they invest in their company and grow if they can't guarantee that when they send patients, the hospitals will honor their contracts? Um, I, I have a very good friend in the industry who secured a contract between the Ministry of Health in, of Iraq and um, a hospital in Europe that was a, a very large contract to send thousands of Iraqi patients to that, ho that hospital for the year. And he actually had, his contract was, was basically a bonus at the end of the year that was around between one to two million dollars based upon the volume of the patients coming in from Iraq. And at the end of the year, that hospital in Europe told him, thank you so much for the patients. And he said, where, you know, can I have my check for all the work that I've done this year? And they said, we, well, we're actually not going to give you a check because we know the Ministry of Health of Iraq. You know, we worked with them years ago, um, and so this is going to be a direct relationship. And then that person went back, and they ended up working with the government to switch hospitals. Um, but nobody wins in that situation, and I think that... Um, you know, facilitators do provide a very strong value in the industry. There is a lot of hand-holding that has to happen, but it's important to protect your buyers. And when I was saying new buyers are coming in every day, if you're also not building your relationship with your buyers, your competitor is going to come in tomorrow and steal that relationship from you. So it's really important to, to do it. And then you have to determine which road am I going to go down in medical tourism um, and wellness tourism from how am I going to, what is my marketing strategy? What is my target market? What am I going to do? Am I going to build the right infrastructure so that I can service patients consistently with great outcomes? Um, am I going to invest in my international patient department, in my marketing? Am I going to create a three- to five-year roadmap? Um, and the roadmap is so important because if you don't have a roadmap, then what's going to happen is your internal stakeholders are constantly going to change which road you travel down. You might be traveling down one road for six months, and then someone says, this isn't working, let's shift, let's change, and go down a totally different road. But if you have that roadmap of you understand exactly what you should do or you shouldn't do, and you focus on that long-term approach and don't deviate, then you'll be successful in 
uh, in medical tourism. So um, that concludes my presentation. Um, are there uh, any questions? Or have I been so thorough that there are just absolutely no questions? Yes. Oh, I thought you were touching your glasses. I thought you were raising your hand. Any, 